Thank you. We had a bit of a challenge there with the, uh, with the systems, but I'm glad it's working. Um, so I'll start off by thanking the organizers for this invitation to speak here. And I'll start with a bit of context um, of, of my uh, department and where I come from. Um, I work for the National Research Council in Canada, which is at Ottawa, which is the capital city of Canada. And primarily, I'm the team leader for immunomodulation. And what that means is that uh, uh, my team has a full expertise in a plethora of uh, innate and uh, adaptive immune assays. Uh, I manage the core flow cytometry facility. We have a number of intracellular infection models, including some level three models in our animal facility, as well as cancer models. And what I'll speak today is really about our adjuvant program, and specifically only one type of adjuvant, archosomes. But essentially what we are able to do is that uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion, bring together lipid chemistry and formulation expertise that exists within our chemistry program with the immunology so that we can really utilize our technologies and facilities to deliver impact. So outline my, of my talk today, I will talk very briefly about the semi-synthetic archosome platform, what the nature of the technology is, and focus on three main points. Some of our new lipid analytics methodology that's helping us to characterize the formulation, and also focus on the selection of the lead synthetic archosome adjuvants based on both immunogenicity and efficacy. And finally, touch upon the mechanism of actions, and I'll wind up with a little bit of context of how this fits in, in, our, in our overall goal of translation vaccinology. So we've heard a very good summary this morning uh, from uh, Dr. Petrov's uh, talk, and uh, this is pretty much similar to that in the sense is we know adjuvants are needed for many different um, areas of filling gaps in vaccinology. And uh, within our portfolio, we have many different adjuvant platforms. Uh, one of them that I'm speaking today is the synthetic archosome platform. We have a light, slightly modified formulation called AMVAD for mucosal immunity, as well as a number of recombinant vectors, as well as novel saponins. And essentially, a couple of areas we are focusing on is to look at the elderly and immunocompromised and see whether our adjuvants can bridge an effective cell-mediated immunity. We're interested in dose sparing in terms of a pandemic or a universal influenza vaccine, as well as we are interested in some needed free delivery aspects such as topical, which are also preliminary works that we're doing. And one of our advantages, some of our adjuvants platforms are very thermostable, so they become very amenable to the uh, cold chain storage, which is again attractive component of new vaccines. So what are archosomes? Archosomes are nothing but archaebacterial liposomes. And many years ago, what some of the microbiologists working at NRC recognized is that the lipids of archaebacteria are extremely unique in that they're not found in any other eukarya or, uh, and they're characterized by fully saturated carbon chains and they essentially come in two flavors, a fully saturated C20 backbone of a phytanal chain or a C40 dimeric form. And what was interesting is because archaea are naturally exist in very harsh climatic niches, like as high salt, the deep sea, and so on, these lipids actually offer extreme stability. Archaea don't have LPS or cell wall, so these lipids are the ones that protect these organisms from harsh climatic zones. What was interesting that it was noted is that when these lipids were actually formulated into liposomes and were used as antigen carriers, we got a very strong immune response. And that essentially serendipitously set the path into developing these as an adjuvant platform. Now, archaebacteria will put many different sugars at the head group of the glycerol backbone. Some of these sugars are unique to the archaea family, and others are more um, ubiquitously found in eukarya. Nevertheless, the properties of these sugars on these archaeal backbones tend to give very different effects. So in the early days, we used to use what we call as a total pol pol polar lipid mixture of archosomes, where we would essentially extract the full mixture of these archaebacterial lipids, constitute them into liposomes, and use them as our antigen carrier. And three main features of this platform are the stability because of these bacterial lipids, as well as safety. These are uh, no, um, lipids derived from non-pathogenic archaea. And in fact, we've done many different studies of repeated dose tolerance and vaccine dose non uh, studies, and they're extremely safe and similar to the inulin adjuvant these are also do not induce tlr responses so again it's another um, non-inflammatory adjuvant if my if i might use uh, your uh, term here dr petro 
Uh, the strength is the real what we focused on because they have very strong ability to induce a long-lasting memory as well as good CDA T cell responses. <clears throat> However, so in the early days with the total polylipid uh, uh, archosomes nearly about a decade ago, we noted that we could actually induce very strong antibody response to an antigen entrapped in these liposomes. And this is just very different <coughs> types of archaea and total polylipids from all these different species would give a very strong response. And the comparison here, the green bars here, are conventional ester liposomes which are made out of synthetic lipids, phosphocholine, for, uh, cholesterol, and so on. So, we then went on to characterize the durability of the immune response, and we noted in mice this response was extremely durable. Here is an ex example of a study in mice which was done for over 400 days, and you can see that the antibody titer lasts for very long. We also characterized the Th1, Th2 shift of this uh, total polar lipid archosome, and we noted that it gives uh, both a Th1 and a Th2 phenotype, uh, as opposed to alum, which just gives the Th2 phenotype. However, most of our focus has, has been in the CD8 area because we recognize that that may be a niche to introduce new adjuvants because there is a girth of adjuvants which can induce a long-lasting CD8 immunity. So we went on to look at that, and in this example here, we are comparing one of our lead archosome formulations with an ovalbumin entrapped as a model antigen with a live vaccine, in this case it's Listeria monocytogenes, expressing the same antigen. And here you can see the longevity of the response. You can see that after two injections, the response is very potent and robust, and it lasts for a very long time in vaccinated mice. Um, we also have done in vivo functionality. This is just an in vivo CTL response, and you see after two injections, the in vivo functionality of the CD8 T cells lasts for a very long time. I won't go into all the different works that was done with this total polar lipid archosome. Just a key efficacy study here showing that in a murine melanoma model, when we used a self antigen, either tyrosylase related protein or GP100, um, we could actually get very good protection. And if we targeted two antigens compared to the naive mice that were non-vaccinated that died within 15 days after the B16 OVA challenge, these mice survived for a prolonged period of time. So this technology was very robust, it was very good, but as we started moving into translations, one of the challenges we noted is that it is a technology based on a mixture of lipids, so it is total polar lipids. And this can be quite, um, quite a concern when you look at a vaccine formulation in terms of characterizing and as also uh, in terms of the regulatory authorities. So more recently, what we have done is to move to a platform, which we call as a semi-synthetic lipids. In this case, what we do is that we chose a strain of archaebacteria, which conveniently produces only one type of core lipid species, the C20 backbone. And what we do is that using a very easily produced uh, methodology and redu reduced solvents, we extract this archaeol core to a very high yield. And then our synthetic chemists are able to add the desired sugar head groups to this glycerol backbone. So here's an example of one of the compounds that they have made. In this case, we have a disaccharide, gentiobiosyl, which is um, attached to the uh, uh, core archaeol lipid. And when we use these kind of very defined lipids as adjuvants, we get very similar response to a total polar lipid. On the left side here is shown a re uh, response in mice after vaccination. We're looking at the uh, CTL response or CD8 T cell response. The line on the top is a total polar lipid mixture, and you can see that this disaccharide gives a very comparable response to a total polar lipid mixture. The same thing holds good for antibody responses as well, where uh, the, uh, the synthetic archosomes also give good antibody responses. What's interesting is that if you just use the archaeol core without the head group, you do not get much response, which is shown here, both for cell-mediated and antibody. So some of the things, of course, with these lipids, the convenience is that we can characterize them very beautifully. So we have now, with our formulations, we do an HPLC. We know exactly what amount of lipids there are. So these are some HPLC profiles for some of our synthetic liposome compounds. And you can see that if we were to choose a formulation which had more than one lipid, we can clearly identify these two lipids, and they are extremely pure and very well-defined in this final formulation. 
So now we have a plethora of different synthetic archosomes that we have uh, made. And what's, what is nice with the system is that we can actually choose what head groups to put. So we can put not only the head groups which are naturally found in the archaea, but we could also put head groups which are not found in archaea, but might have some specific interaction with uh, um, immune cell receptors. So here are a sample of some of the head groups. In this case, we are comparing always with the green line here, which is our total polar lipid mixture. And you can see clearly with many of our formulations, there's a rank order. Some of them are much better for antibody response than the other. This is just your naive mice here. And on the right side, again, we have other formulations. The bottom line here is a three lipid formulation, which is, uh, gives a very good response. But we also have a single lipid formulation, which also gives a very good response. And what's interesting is this, by this methodology, we are also able to select out lipids, which would give either antibody or cell-mediated immunity. So for example, in this slide here, we're looking at cell-mediated immunity. And on the left side here, we, what we did was to choose a formulation which actually has three, um, um, four major lipids, um, actually three lipids, and this, this is just a neutral lipid mixed in to make a nice formulation. It doesn't have much activity. And you can see that in this case, we have a mannose, which is attached to the archaeol, which we are targeting the mannose receptor. We have a GLUC3, which is targeting the uh, scavenger receptor, and PS of phosphatidylserine, which is targeting the phosphatidylserine receptor. And because the PS here is in a different stereochemistry than in eukaryotic system, it actually becomes an immunostimulant rather than an immunosuppression. And you can see that compared to our, our total polar lipid formulation, you get very good uh, response with this three lipid formulation. Another example here is a single lipid formulation. Here again, we are using certain purified, just the neutral core lipids, just as a control here. And this lipid formulation with the head group gives a very good uh, and robust LE spot response for interferon gamma producing cells. We have gone on further to use these defined lipids in a melanoma challenge model with self antigens. So in this case, we are using a B16 melanoma, but the we are using is either tyrosinase related protein, which is entrapped, and this is just the profile that we can also quantitate the antigen by HPLC within our formulation. The top one just shows the functionality of the CD8 T cell response that's induced against uh, tyrosinase related protein, and you can see that some of our synthetic liposomes give very good response. There are others that don't give a good re response. Example, in this case, we, for example, we put Ramnose. Ramnose is known to interact with certain inflammatory receptors in other systems, so we thought, what about if we put it on an archaeol system, what will happen? And obviously, that wasn't a very good one at all. Whereas our uh, ones that are normally found in archaea, which uh, we know target the scavenger receptor and so on, give a very good response. There is certainly a rank order in terms of how these lipids function, which is again shown here in an interferon gamma producing LE spot. This by far is our best formulation, gives a very robust response. And this is then followed with efficacy in a murine melanoma model with the B16 model we heard about in the morning. And here we can see that compared to control mice that would die within the first 20 days, our vaccinated animals do very well. And the blue line here is a total polar lipid mixture. And the green line here is our semi-synthetic, very defined formulation, giving you very similar response. And this is just the tumor size on two weeks afterwards. And you can see a dramatic decrease in the tumor size in these mice. I'm often asked the question, how do these lipids work? And uh, for some of our lipids, we have um, defined the, uh, the mechanism of action. And for certain others, we are still in the process of defining. And so this is how we think it works based on some of the lipids we have completed the work for so far. Um, what normally happens is that the head group, the sugar head group, interacts with a receptor on the antigen-presenting cell. These are usually non-TLR receptors. We find they are either mannose or scavenger receptors. Then this results in a receptor mediated an uptake of these uh, lip uh, liposomes, and the antigen is then specifically delivered into the phagosomal compartment, which leads to a good CD4 response. What interesting is that because of the stability of these lipids, these are non-fusogenic liposomes. However, under the condition of acidification of the phagosome, these lipids fuse with the phagolysosomal membrane and release the antigen cargo into the cytosol, leading to a TAP-dependent MHC class 1 antigen presentation. 
Much of this work was done in murine cells, but more recently we have started to characterize this work in an in vivo system. In this case, for example, uh, the second aspect of immunostimulation comes not from vaccine delivery, but the fact that these head groups also induce co-stimulation and differentiation of dendritic cells. So here, for example, is a um, um, human monocyte or macrophage cell line, and when we have these are unstimulated, and you're looking at CD86 expression as an indication of co-stimulatory expression on these cells. And what we see is that compared to our total polar lipid archosomes, which we knew could induce very good co-stimulation, some of our synthetic archosomes also induce strong co-stimulation. So, and also the cytokine responses tend to be muted, but the co-stimulation is very strong. And this is why we think that induces a good uh, CD8 T cell response as well. So I'd like to conclude by saying that we have a platform of semi-synthetic archosomes. They have many different properties. I did not have time to go into the entire um, bulk of study that we have done. Uh, suffice to say that these are robust immune, immune response inducers. We have a very long durable immunity for cell-mediated immunity. We have done extensive preclinical safety, um, as well as some proof of concept work with uh, vaccines and mechanism of action studies. Our IP is extremely strong. We have greater than 13 issued patents in this uh, portfolio. Um, and because of the way we produce this, uh, we know that the cost of goods will be low. One of the things I didn't touch upon is that these lipids, despite being very stable, do have a membrane fluidity. This is, again, another adaptation to allow archaea to survive in harsh niches. So we also think that these might be very useful for alternative routes of delivery because they have no phase transition and they are, do not oxidize, they don't yellow, and they're highly thermostable. So one of the areas we're looking into are these alternate routes of immunization. And uh, if you're interested to, to know what we're doing in this area, please come and see me later. I, I didn't have time to touch upon that. And the last slide here to just indicate, the, so how does this fit into the context of what we do? Um, we are, NRC is a government research institution, and we work very closely with the industry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. If I can close this, okay, sorry. Uh, that's just to keep you on, make sure everybody's awake after lunch. <laughs> so, um, so we work very closely with industry, Canadian small and medium industry, as well as large vaccine manufacturers. We have four major platforms in antigens and adjuvants, manufacturing processes, especially for vaccines, in bioprocessing and vaccine delivery. And a number of targets we are working with is indicated here. Our main aim is to develop vaccines for high risk populations because this is our concern in Canada. And uh, some of the targets are, include influenza, bacterial pneumonias, nosocomial infection, chronic infections, particularly hepatitis C, uh, biodefense vaccines, and cancers. And these are our in-house vaccine platform that we collaborate with industry. And not, last but not the least, I'd like to thank all my team, my core archosome team, many members who have been with me for many years, and the chemists as well as the microbiologists, who work very integrally with my core immunology team to do all the immunology studies, a number of internal collaborators from various teams which help us with the studies, and of course, through the years, funding from NIH, CIHR, and Ontario Institute of Cancer Research that has made this possible. Thank you. So, a very nice talk. Uh, questions? Yep. Have you looked at the durable efficacy of your response? So, like in your melanoma model, I don't know how long you waited after the vaccination. Have you waited a long time to still get sick? Yes. So, the studies that, I, uh, that were uh, shown here was actually vaccinated about six weeks after the vaccination is when the challenge was done. We have waited right up to about maybe 12 or 14 weeks of vaccination, and it does work very well. In a Listeria vaccine model, we actually waited nine months after vaccination, and when we challenged with Listeria, basically none of the animals were, um, had any bacterial burden at all. In a therapeutic setting as well, we've done the melanoma, and we can usually inject about a day after and get very good, about 50% of the mice will survive over 100 days. So. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Great talk. Great talk. Great talk. Great talk.